Well, it's, it's really a great honor to be um, giving this, this first talk at the meeting um, for Jean Calabi's 90th birthday. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, what I'll be talking about is a, um, a topic which is, to a large extent, been created by Calabi. Um, the, briefly, you could say the search for an optimal Taylor metric on a compact complex manifold. And um, there's um, re renowned work of Calabi going back uh, about 60 years to the 1950s, um, particularly the, <coughs> talking about Kähler Einstein metrics, which we'll discuss. And then um, more, more recent work, say, <coughs> only about 30 years ago, on uh, what we call extremal metrics, which uh, we'll also we'll talk about. So well, I'll be trying to cover rather a lot of ground, and this is aimed to be a sort of colloquium-style talk. So I obviously won't be able to. I have to, to miss out a lot, and uh, don't really won't be able to say anything very in proper detail. But the um, the main point I want to um, convey is that these. Um, deep uh, and seminal ideas of Calabi have uh, given rise to lots of things that have been done by, by many people over the last uh, 60 years or so, but also lead to lots of um, unsolved problems, which um, will likely give uh, work for mathematicians for the next 60 years to come. So this is uh, the kind of point I'm trying to, overall point I'm trying to make. So let me um, try to make a start on this oops, uh, ambitious goal. Um, and to just recall uh, that uh, in, in differential geometry, we have va various notions of, of curvature. And, um, and, and various notions of the, the sign of the curvature, depending upon the exact context. Uh, and let's just begin with the. Um, for the, <coughs> the, 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 the classical situation of uh, the case of two real dimensions. So we talk about the sign. Um, <coughs> where we have the Gauss curvature. And uh, this is linked to topology by the, uh, the, the name's gauss bonnet formula. The, 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 the integral of the Gauss curvature over a closed surface is um, <coughs> given by a multiple of the Euler characteristic. So we have the, um, just restricting to the oriented case of simplicity, we have, uh, we have the, the, the positive situation with the two sphere, positive Euler characteristic, the, uh, the, the, the torus, the zero Euler characteristic, and surfaces of high, higher genus of, uh, of, an, of, of negative Euler characteristic. So this says that on, if we have a, a surface, depending on which type it's in, the average value of the curvature has got the appropriate sign. Um, a sort of old theorem, essentially the uniformization theorem, says that, in fact, if we have any Riemannian metric on a surface, then we can change it conformally so that the, the, uh, after that change, the metric has got constant Gauss curvature with the constant determined by the, the, uh, the sign uh, given by this topological requirement. So moving on from this sort of very old paradigm, we come to the um, to discuss the the the, 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 <coughs> the case for higher dimensional uh, x uh, compact complex manifold complex dimension n compact, and we want to consider a, a Kähler metric on x. Now, there are various ways of defining this. Uh, one, one simple way is to say that in Riemannian geometry, 
we have, we have a general Romanian metric. We have a notion of uh, geodesic coordinates at a given point. If we take a given point, then we can choose coordinates such the metric agrees with the, the Euclidean metric up to first order. So it's plus order x squared, schematically. Uh, a way of defining a Kähler metric is to say that we can do this, but we can also make it compatible with the complex structure so we can take our coordinates to be the real and imaginary parts of holomorphic coordinates from the point of view of um, the, the complex structure. So we So if we have a, then a, a complex Kähler manifold, we have two basic topological uh, things that we can consider. One is the, the first churn class of the manifold, and the other is the, the cohomology class of the, 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 the Kähler metric. This condition implies that the, the, the metric defines a closed two-form. So we get two different classes in the real cohomology of X. So I realize this is a bit more technical for people who are not geometry and topology specialists. Um, but actually, these, the, the precise definition of these will not really enter too much. So if you're, not, if you're not familiar with these, don't really worry, because just assume that they're certain symbols that we can write down. In any case, we can consider, among all these uh, compact Kähler manifolds, we can consider ones where we have the, the, the property that, this, that these, these classes are proportional. So we consider, suppose C1 of x is um, multiple of omega. So this may not be true, but, let me, but for, for, for a general compact complex manifold, but let's consider the cases where it is. So there we have, they're going to have then three cases where lambda is positive, zero, or negative. So what, what Kalabi realized and pointed out back in the, um, the early 1950s was that in this situation, we have a, a good geometric problem for generalizing this classical situation derived from the fact that the Ricci curvature of a, a complex Kähler manifold is a representative of this first churn class. So C1 of x is represented by the, the Ricci form. So if we're in this situation, we have the, 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 the necessary background to ask the question of whether we can find a Kähler metric such that, in fact, the Ricci curvature is a multiple of the metric, as this is just the, the, the Einstein equation in the, in the Kähler situation. Can we, can we find a metric? Can we find, can we solve, so this way, the, the Kähler Einstein equation? In this situation, such that actually this Ricci is equal to lambda of omega. So, this precisely would generalize in, in the case of complex dimension one, this would just, the Ricci tensor would boil down essentially this Gauss curvature. And this would just be the generalization of the constant Gauss curvature condition that we mentioned before. So of course, as well as solving, as well as asking this quick, the question, Kalabi also proved many. Um, 
basic results in, in, the, in this direction towards, towards answering the question. But let me just recall a bit more of, of how this, the setup of this goes. A wonderful thing about Taylor metrics is that they can locally be determined by a single function. So locally, the Kähler potential <coughs> phi. So our metric can be expressed as the, in terms of the, the second derivatives of this function, as follows. So if we do, if we if we work out the second derivative. We get at each point a Hermitian metric, a, a, a Hermitian matrix, and we're saying that in these complex coordinates, that is the, the metric tensor, with the obvious adjustment between real and complex notation. And in fact, this Kähler Einstein equation, although it apparently depends, because apparently the, the Ricci curvature. Uh, depends upon two derivatives of the metric, so you expect that to depend upon four derivatives of this uh, Kähler potential. In fact, it can be uh, we can integrate out essentially uh, two derivatives and write it in uh, a, a very um, powerfully explicit form. So the Kähler takes the form. If in this local version, of simplicity, that we take this. Uh, we take this uh, Kähler potential phi, we take this matrix of second derivatives, and we take its determinant, and then this should be equal to e to the minus lambda times phi. We got the sine right, I hope. So I'm not, I'm not going to explain why, and I haven't explained what the Ricci curvature is, and I'm not going to explain how this equation sort of leads to this more explicit equation, except to say that what we've got here is essentially the volume form of the metric. This is the metric tensor taking its determinant gives the volume form, and the Ricci curvature is all to do with volume forms. And so from one point of view, it gives, we work in this sort of gd coordinates at the point, and we ask how the volume form of the metric looks, and when we make this expansion, then the second order term is given by the Ricci curvature. Or another way of saying it is that this, this C1 of x, this is, this is essentially, well, I'm saying it's the first Chern class of the, of the canonical bundle of x, as algebra geometer would say, and we can think of the volume, the, 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 the Ricci curvature is the curvature of the canonical bundle, minus the curvature, and uh, the volume form, is giving a volume form is the same as giving a metric on this canonical bundle. So um, to, to, apart from to muttering that it's all to do with volumes, I'm not going to say anything more about this equation. But at least you can see it's a, um, an explicit kind of equation you can write down. It's a, called a, it's a version of a complex Mont-Jampère equation because it involves this determinant of uh, this, this matrix of second derivative, and is uh, much related to the, the real Monge-Ampere equation. Where, where you would have, you would take some, let's just consider, say, a, con a convex function f, you take the, sec they take the Hessian matrix of second derivatives, and that this should be some function of f and its first derivatives, or, or something depending upon the context. So these complex Mont-Jampère equations are bound up with the study of the, the Kähler-Einstein uh, condition. Uh, there's also a, a, a real analog to which also Calabi made um, many important contributions. Of course, these are highly nonlinear equations because the determinant is a very non nonlinear function. And these things are important, particularly, for example, in the subject of affine differential geometry. To say, in, in classical 
differential geometry, say of surfaces in R3, we consider properties that are invariant under the Euclidean group of translations and rotations of R3. In, in affine differential geometry, we consider properties of surfaces that are invariant under all affine transformations of R3. We don't, we don't fix a, a metric on our three-dimensional space. Anyway, this, this, this was the area, research area, which um, Talabi's work from this time sort of in initiated. And um, a, a, a huge amount of work has been done on it. So it turns out that the, the, this, the sign of lambda is very crucial uh, in the study of this equation. The, the, um, the uh, so well, conventional approach, which was pursued for 20 years or so, was to, was to study this equation via a priori estimates, or perhaps embedding this in a larger family of equations, and deriving a priori estimates for various quantities involving the scalar potential by um, by subtle and ingenious arguments. And then if, 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 if lambda is, is negative, then well, the, the two, every, all the, the signs work out in a good way when you want to do these estimates, and if lambda is positive, they don't. So the, the, the case when lambda is less than naught was solved by, by, um, by Ober and Yao. When lambda is equal to zero, it was solved by Yao. It's both in the 1970s. And um, the case when lambda is positive is the hard case. And this would correspond to, in algebra geometric terms, this corresponds to cases where the, the first churn class is a positive class. It can be it's a, it can be written as the class of a Kähler metric. And then the, 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 the corresponding manifolds in algebra geometric terms would be called Fano manifolds. So in, in, in these two, the, the, the negative and positive and zero case, um, there's a straightforward existence for it, but in, the, in this Fano situation, it was realized for, for many years that well, that can't be the case. <coughs> there's, a, there's an old theorem of Matsushima who says that if we have a, a, a Kähler Einstein metric, then the automorphism group of X, the holomorphic automorphism group, is, is reductive. A, a reductive Lie group. That's to say, it's, this is a, a complex Lie group, but it must be the complexification of a compact group. So this is a, some groups, some Lie groups are, and some aren't. So in particular, if you take, say, the, the projective plane, and you blow up a point, then its automorphism group is not reductive, so this has got no Kähler-Einstein metric. And in fact, you can see, in a more, more basic way, you can see why <coughs> Um, the, having automorphisms can show that there's no possibility of just a naive way deriving a priori estimates, because if you have a if you have uh, one of these holomorphic automorphisms f from x to x, then if you have one solution omega, you have another solution given by pulling back by f. So if you have a if, if this is a non-compact group, um, then you can take a take a a sequence of f's <coughs> to diverging, and so this sequence of pullbacks will diverge in any reasonable sense. They can't satisfy any fixed uniform estimate. So in the simplest case, for example, of the two-sphere, you know, we, can, we can write down a, a round metric on the two-sphere, but we can apply conformal transformations of the two-sphere to get many more, in which we squash all the volume, all the area up into an arbitrary small neighborhood of a point or something.
So in fact, in a sense, it's much, from kind of a, a PDE point of view, in a sense, it's much easier to prove the existence of a, a, a kahler einstein metric on some complicated high-dimensional variety of, of negative curvature than to prove the existence of the round metric on the two-sphere if you didn't happen to know that one existed. <laughs> of course, of course, you do. So, following this renowned work of, of, of Yao and Ober in the 1960s, the 1970s, this was the uh, a big question of the field of just when should the um, Defano manifolds have Kahler Einstein metrics. <coughs> but as we said, going, going beyond that, in um, Important paper in 1983, Kalabi introduced a, a, a more general question of uh, asking, uh, de first defining and asking about the existence of what's called extremal metrics. So, for this, what 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 um, we can do is we can take if we have any. Kahler Einstein manifold, we can take the L2 norm of the curvature tensor and think of this as a functional on the space of Kahler Einstein metrics, so on the space of Kahler metrics, or more precisely, I mean the space of Kahler metrics in a fixed cohomology class with the class of, the class of omega fixed. So I, I believe this, actually, this, this idea actually entered also into his, um, his earlier work uh, uh, as well. Uh, of course, uh, around 1980, it was particularly, was, was the, the, there were clear analogies then with the, the study of um, the Yang-Mills functional, in which you study the L2 norm of the curvature of a more general connection, a different setting. In any case, we can ask, so what are the, the Euler-Lagrange equations of this functional, if we, uh, if we consider it on the space of metrics in a fixed class, the Euler-Lagrange equations, um, they, they, these can be expressed by saying that if we take, if we take the gradient of the scalar curvature, so it's right as S, so this is the trace of the Ricci curvature, just a, just a function, we take the gradient in the usual Riemannian geometry sense. This is a vector field. Uh, if we multiply that by i using the complex structure, then this should be a whole. This is a a holomorphic killing field. That's to say, both the the one parameter group generated by this vector field is both it generates complex automorphisms, the kind we were considering here but also Riemannian automorphisms, isometries of the Riemannian manifold. <coughs> and a particularly important case here is when the scalar curvature is constant. So, of course, this vector field is zero, in particular. So, so th th these things, this is the definition of an extremal metric, but a particularly important case is the case of constant scalar curvature. For example, you might be studying a complex manifold which has got no non-trivial holomorphic vector fields, and so any extremal metric is forced to be constant scalar curvature. So again, it's plausible that, that such things should exist, because we might feel that if we try to minimize this, 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 the, 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 the norm of the Riemannian curvature, we might feel there ought to be some minimum, some optimal metric, which will give us this extremal metric. But again, there are, there are examples, uh, due, going back to uh, Levine originally, uh, exploiting this, the automorphism group to show that, 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 again, there's no simple existence theorem. So we can find a, a manifold X with the holomorphic automorphism group of X is equal to C. Therefore, this is no extremal metric. Why is that? Because 
because this vector field, if we had one, is supposed to be a killing field, um, that, that would mean that we have to have some, this, this thing would have to generate a compact subgroup of the automorphism group, but C has got no non-trivial compact subgroup. So that means that this, um, that if it had an extremal metric, the scalar curvature would have to be constant. But in fact, this Matsushima theorem that we stated here in the Kähler-Einstein case applies equally well to constant scalar curvature. So the automorphism group would have to be reductive, but, but C is not reductive. So, so uh, by, by such arguments, you see that this, this manifold, which you can write down quite explicitly, has no extremal metric. So the, the, what we find then is that when we ask these uh, natural questions about how to find a, an optimal metric on a, on a, on a, on a Kähler manifold in, in somewhat different contexts, uh, then the, um, the answers have to be quite difficult. It's hard, it's hard to even know what is true, let alone to prove anything. So the general idea of what's believed, or in some cases proved to be true, is that the, the criterion for existence in these kind of problems should be related to stability. So, general conjecture uh, is that the existence should be related to stability. So what we want is a criteria. We have this, this um, complex manifold, which is let's say a complex algebra <coughs> manifold. Uh, we want some algebra geometric criteria, which we can state, but under which we can solve this differential geometric problem. And this is, the, this is what uh, one expects to be true. So these, this, 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 this sort of idea was promoted initially in the Kader einstein case by Yao many, many years ago and has been refined by, by various people over the years in, in different, different directions. But let me just, and I'm not going to try to define this precisely, but just to give a general idea, is that stability has to do with studying degenerations of our manifold X. So let's so say everything is complex here, or even algebraic. We consider a family, an n plus one dimensional family with a map, it's called, a, it's called a flat family, we should say technically, such that the fibers for non zero t are isomorphic to the manifold X we started with, whereas the fiber over zero. is some other object, not, not necessarily, and in the case of interest not, isomorphic to X. And in fact, this thing could actually be, uh, this could be some kind of singular variety or even, in principle, a scheme or something like that. So we, we, we should study degenerations of this kind, and the notion of stability is saying that X is stable if, for all such degenerations, there's a certain a certain numerical invariant should be should have the right signs. So, so I'm, I'm not going to have time to explain. Uh, in an example, this will hopefully see what this is. Uh, but I'm not going to try to explain it in detail. But if we have such a generation, then we can assign a numerical invariant to it. The notion of stability is saying that X is stable if any time you degenerate it this Futaki invariant is positive. So, and say the reversions of such conjectures for extremal metrics, constant scalar curvature metrics, and these kähler einstein metrics on Fano manifolds. And in fact, in the last case, this is actually a no longer conjecture, but a, but a theorem. And um, if luck, I shall 
have time at, at the end of the talk to say something about that. Um, this is, say, in advance, so this, is, this, this last part will be some joint work with Shen and Sun. But it, uh, in, the, in the talks, in the more detailed talks, um, which um, Scott mentioned on Monday, I should be concentrating on that. So if I don't get to say really anything sensible about it today, uh, I will try to make up for that on Monday. But what I want to try to do for the next um, section of the talk, that's a quarter of an hour or so, is to illustrate how this works in the case of toric manifolds. Because I think that's a good way of getting a... One can make the... Uh, what's going on. Fairly accessible. So, let me look at the toric manifolds. So, let's say we want to consider a manifold X of complex dimension N with an action of the N dimensional torus acts. So, we want to this acts holomorphically, and we want to consider metrics that are invariant under this action. Then, there's a big theory about these things which says that. They're essentially determined by a, a polytope, P, in Rn, a convex polytope in Rn, which uh, you can think of as being obtained by just taking, by my point, you just take the quotient of x over t as to P. So that's the, the, the basic case, say, is to say, say x is S2. So n is 1. We're taking that the one-dimensional torus is the circle. We're taking that as acting on the sphere by rotating about an axis. If we take the quotient space, we get an interval. And say, so we take any point in the interior of the interval, the fiber, plus body orbit, is a circle. But when we go to the boundary, these circles collapse down to points. And um, the, the general case is similar if we take, say, uh, some uh, polygon in R2, then we should think of a, a, a two-complex dimensional manifold, of a four-real dimensional manifold, which is built up by taking for each point in the interior of the polygon a two-dimensional torus. We go to the bound this part of the boundary it collapses to one-dimensional torus, we go to the vertices, it collapses to points. In any case, what one then gets, if we want to do differential geometry on these toric manifolds, we can, if we like, express everything in more elementary terms as working on a, a polygon in Rn. And n is rapidly going to become equal to 2. So it turns out that we can express a Kähler metric can be expressed in terms of a certain convex function on, uh, on P, which is, in fact, it's, it's called the Legendre transform of the, K of, the, of the Kähler potential we were considering before, um, which satisfies such suitable boundary conditions on the boundary. I went, I went to write down. So what is the extremal? The ex we, we just ask for extremal metrics in this toric situation. They can be described in the following way. You consider a functional f of u, which has got a nonlinear term. So we take, we take this determinant of the Hessian. We might, let's just write that as uij, say this matrix of second derivatives. We take its logarithm, and we integrate that over p. And then we add on a apparently innocuous linear term. So let's write L A of U. L A of U 
is given by the integral of u over the boundary of the polygon with respect to a certain measure that comes with these, this comes into these boundaries. So there's a certain measure on the boundary, which is just a multiple of the vague measure on each face, uh, which is given by the geometry. And we take that um, the integral of u with respect to that measure, and then we, mark, we subtract off the integral of a times u over p. Where a is a certain, um, a certain affine linear function, a fixed affine linear function. In the case of constant scalar curvature, uh, in fact, A would be a constant, you know, a general extremal metric. It's not quite constant, but it only varies linearly over the polygon. So an extremal metric is given by finding a, a critical point of this function, in fact, a minimum of a function. Uh, among all convex functions on the, the polygon, P. So you, you, you get a sort of a, an idea about, without trying to prove anything, you get a kind of a, a physical intuition about what, what this is saying. But we're trying to minimize F, so we're trying to make the determinant, we'd like to make this determinant of the Hessian large. We'd like, from that point of view, we'd like to make, um, we'd like to make um, U grow, grow rapidly as we approach the boundary. On the hand, we all have this linear function L, which involves the integral of U over the boundary. So if we make, if we make our function grow too rapidly at the boundary, this term will become bad. So that, that will stop F becoming large. So the minimizing the functional has to do with balancing this, this term against this, this term, roughly speaking. And, in fact, when, when n is 2, it's more, more or less a complete theory of this problem. First, in, in the case when a is a constant, this was uh, done by me a few years ago, and it extended to al almost the general case by um, um, by three authors, B. Chen, Li, and Sheng. The general case. And I, I, I can tell you how, how the, what, what the answer is, and it, um, so more or less, you, you should have some intuition as to why it, sh it should be correct. So what it says is there's a, there's a solution exists, I, a solution of this minimizing problem, if and only if this linear function has the following property, but LA of F is weakly positive for all convex F on P, and strictly positive unless F is affine linear. But this, I didn't explain it, but this affine linear function A is determined precisely by the condition that this functional should vanish on the affine linear functions. It's not a necessary condition. So this is the this is the um, turns out to be the criteria for the the solving of this nonlinear equation, minimising this problem. Actually, I, I forgot to put in what I the point which I. Mention of the abstract, so let me put it in now. Well, this is, this is we, we could consider functionals more generally, we could consider functionals which are given by the integrating some function of the determinant of the Hessian. Uh, and we get a family of equations of, um, so more generally, or, or let's say, let's here. in particular, if we take the function to be uh, a, per, a power, if we take the integral of Get uij to the 1 over n plus 2, 
then we get an interesting equation that the Euler Lagrange equation is functional. It's an interesting equation, which is uh, studied in a way by, by Calabi, called the affine maximal equation. That's to say, the, the Euler Lagrange equations, uh, if we think of the, the function u as the, the graph of u as a surface in R3, then the Euler Lagrange equations are actually affine invariant. This is actually an affine invariant functional. And so this is a, a, a natural topic in, in affine differential geometry, so which is studied by Calabi. And in fact, the, the kind of PDE techniques um, which are developed by, by Trudering and Wang for studying this problem are also very um, useful for studying this extremal problem. The, what, the, what we get is a, a complicated family of fourth order, nonlinear fourth order <coughs> PDE arising from these kind of uh, equations, or Lagrange equations. So I, I, I should have said that a bit earlier in the discussion. In any, any case, what, what we get is in the two-dimensional case, we do in the end get a, a, a definite criteria for um, solving this problem. R roughly speaking, supposing, supposing, supposing we had, a, say, LA of F is say positive, then if we take some 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 u naught, and we take some large multiple of f, so t big of the zort, then we can make this functional as small as we like because uh, we get a little. Th th um, sorry, this is all of this is less than zero to say because. Uh, this, this thing, we can make this, this is linear, so this is a multiple of t, a negative multiple of t, uh, and this has got a log in, so it'll only grow slowly with respect to t, so it'll grow a great log of t, grow slowly. So if, if, uh, if you have such a, a function in which, which this linear LA of f is negative, then you can write down, you can see that this, this function can't be that bounded below, and what the, the uh, the upshot of the theory is that that's that the that the, the, um, the converse is also true. So this um, this maybe doesn't look very explicit because we have to study all possible convex functions f on p. But in fact, you can. Um, Maybe strictly for simplicity, I should talk about for, for, for exactly precisely true. I should talk about the constant scalar curvature case. Here. In fact, it suffices to consider f of the following form. If, we if, if alpha is an affine linear function, let's write say f alpha is the maximum of alpha and zero. So in the, in the, in the, so the one-dimensional case, this is the graph of alpha. We had a function with a single discontinuity in its derivative. So it suffices, it's the fact it suffices not to look at all the general complex functions, but these, this special small family is given by an affine linear function. So what does all this have to do with stability uh, in, in the form that I outlined? So supposing we have, supposing we're in the bad case so we don't have a solution. So we draw a picture of our polygon. So remember, this, always is, just, this is just known for the two-dimensional situation. Toric manifolds of complex dimension two. So we have we have such a violating f alpha. So we can think of that as if we look at the if we look at the, the discontinuity in f alpha, it will be some line dividing our polygon into two pieces. So it turns out that 
these two pieces also satisfy the condition that they also define toric manifolds. So this picture of, sort of in, in Rn corresponds in complex geometry to degenerating a complex manifold into the union of two pieces. The simplest case would be to say, so for example, if we take n equals 1, then we can take a, a conic, say x, y equals epsilon. So if we think of taking the corresponding projective curve, that's a, a copy of the two-sphere, but epsilon is um, non-zero, well, then we can degenerate that. So it's, let's say one, so this is a conic, this is a non-singular conic. Isomorphic to S2, if we, if we take the corresponding we add points to infinity. Uh, if we take xy equals zero, then um, we get we get a union of two two spheres. So this is the simplest kind of way in algebraic geometry in which you can degenerate one thing to another one, just by uh, in the limit getting something which breaks up into two pieces. So in other words, this picture, what the, what, what, uh, the conclusion is, that if there's no solution, if there's no solution, then we can construct an x x naught, which is uh, reducible, uh, given by a union of two pieces, as, the, as, in, discussion, as in our discussion. And um, this, this, the sign of this, this LA of U, this is actually that, the, the Futaki invariant we talked about. So the sign of this thing, which is the crucial thing that we saw in the existence problem, this essentially corresponds to the Futaki invariant. So, right. Most of what I've said has analogs in the general story. For example, this functional here is what's called, in, in the general situation, you have what's called the Mabuchi functional. This is the sort of Mabuchi functional written down in a special case. Um, um, but I, rather than trying to explain that, I've taken the point of view of trying to write down this perhaps rather situation where we've written down a rather elementary uh, form and, and stated explicitly. Uh, what, what I should, what I should emphasize, although, the, although the, in the end the statements can be made quite simple and easy to grasp, the proofs are, are all very long and, and, and difficult because they involve grappling with this complicated fourth order PDE, which arises from this function. So now, I, so as promised, go on to the last part of the talk, which I'll talk about this, uh, this, this rather older problem. But, but, but before that, what I should say is that beyond this, if we ask about the general question about these, the existence of these extremal metrics or constant scalar curvature metrics, uh, no one really has very much idea at all. Uh, with great effort, we can solve what's the simplest case, where we both impose this large symmetry, this toric symmetry, which makes things much easier, and also we work in the, the smallest interesting dimension, n equals 2. So kind of the, the simplest possible case, we more or less have a, a good understanding of, but beyond that, no one really has any idea very much at all. So this is what I mean when I say that this um, work for mathematicians for many years to come in uh, trying to develop these, these ideas uh, introduced by Kalabi. So the last few minutes, maybe about like 10 minutes or so, um, I, I should talk about, um, go back to the case of Fano manifolds.
So I say this is joint work with Su Shong Chen, one of the Kalabi's former students, and uh, Song Sun, who I suppose is a Kalabi grand student. Since Song is a student of Chen. Um, so we haven't we haven't really I didn't really properly define this stability. So that's I'm, I'm not going to start trying to do that now. But the but the, 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 the theorem is the basic statement is that we have a Kähler Einstein metric. So a, a, a Kähler Einstein metric exists. So this is as conjectured by by Yao many many years ago in some form, if and only if x is stable. Uh, given that I haven't properly precisely defined this uh, notion. So let me just say something about this. The, 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 the approach we use is to use, to embed the problem in a family that's somewhat different to the, the families that have been considered before. If we take a sort of divisor in X, a complex co-dimensional one submanifold of suitable kind, then we consider metrics with cone singularities transverse to D. So in a, in a complex co-dimension one, real dimension two, in the transverse direction we see a, a real two-dimensional picture. And what we're saying is the metric is modeled on a cone of the kind we're familiar with. So that the, the length of this thing will not be two pi, it will be two pi beta, where naught there's some beta is equal to one. And then the idea is to uh, start in a regime for a small beta where you can relatively easily prove existence of a Kähler Einstein metric with this, this kind of singularity. Then see that we can deform beta. If we, have a, if we have a solution for one cone angle, we can slightly increase the cone angle into that solution. And then say either as we keep trying to deform and deform and deform, either we can go all the way up to cone angle 2 pi, which is to say we've found the smooth Kähler Einstein metric that we wanted, or we must get stuck at some point. And the way we get stuck precisely allows us to construct this degeneration which is going to contradict stability. This is, this is the strategy. Either deform. In this case, a smooth k Einstein metric, or construct the generation x, as we discussed uh, in outline before. So there's, a, there's a lot of so, so so in my lectures on Monday for those who are, not everyone will be, even be here on Monday but for those who are in my lectures on Monday and possibly even later in the week I will be talking about more technically about all these things um, but kind of the, the one of the, that's the, 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 the the crucial thing we need to do is supposing supposing we have some sequence of angles beta i say increasing to some limit beta infinity. And so supposing we have our solutions omega i for these angles, then what we want to do is to find a limit as an algebraic variety. That, that's to say, we want this limit, x naught, this is going to be, after substantial more work, precisely the fiber over zero of our degeneration. But the, but the crucial thing is, can we take a, a sequence of these k einstein metrics, or well, with these singularities, but that's a bit of technicality, 
and get a limit which again has got an actual algebraic structure. So there is a there is a um, a well-established theory of taking limits of Riemannian manifolds in some sense, in, in some sort of weak sense. That's to say, we can take gromov hausdorff limits. So this is really a notion from metric space geometry. If we have a and B metric spaces, then um, we define the, the, the gromov hausdorff distance. Recall the definition. This is the the infimum of the numbers epsilon, so to exist symmetric on the disjoint union, uh, which, as I said in words, agrees with the given metrics on the two factors, and such that A and B are both epsilon dense. So we have these two things. We want to, be able to put a metric on the disjoint union agreeing with the given metric on the two pieces, such that for each point of each point of um, A, there's a point of B within a distance epsilon of it, and similarly for each point of B is a point of distance A within epsilon of it. So if you can think of this saying there's a kind of an approximate map. You think of we don't have an exact map from A to B, but to each point of A we can we can associate a set of a set in B of small diameter which will approximately correspond to A, and vice versa. So it's a kind of a smudged map between A and B. In any case, this is the, um, the famous definition introduced by Gromov. And we can apply it to Riemannian manifolds, so like the, so the, the metrics defined in the usual way by Riemannian manifolds. And under very general conditions, if we have a sequence of Riemannian manifolds, uh, we have a we can take a subsequence which has got a gromov hausdorff limit. So we can get we get some initially a metric space to which our metrics converge in this sense. So the, the um, there's no real problem in getting a limit in some sense, in this gromov hausdorff sense, as a, as a metric space. The essential point, which I think there's no, it's no real value of my trying to say anything more about it now, is to say we want this gromov hausdorff limit, which starts life as a metric space, actually to be a, an algebraic variety. Well, then, they say, we, with more work, we fit it into one of these degenerations. Of course, the sign of the Futaki invariant, that's got to be come into the picture. Uh, but um, that's, in the end, how this, this strategy for proving this theorem goes. OK, so I should finish. Um, yeah, D, D, right, that's a good question. So but, but this could be, we can take, um, we can take essentially any multiple of the anti-canonical system. So, we, so, so this is a, we, so D is going to be in, for some positive lambda, a smooth divide. So by general, if you have a Fano manifold, then by general facts, we can choose a, a multiple such there are smooth divisors in this class. Can take any one. So in general, can you, can you, can you think of the stability of the pair? Or in, in this case, you describe D, but in general, if you chose a D that is perhaps in another class, would, would then the stability that's relevant to the stability of the, of the pair? Yeah, well, the, the, there is a natural notion of stability of pair. That's essentially what we do to make it. Ocean of, that's right, it's pretty, so it's, it's, it's very much mal modeled on the corresponding things for parabolic bundles and things of that kind, where you, again, you, um. Is there a reason that habit time 
time to expect that you can go from this, what's really a real family, because you have the beta parameter, which is real, to a complex family? There's a lot of work involved in that. Yeah, uh, I mean, in fact, I, there's something I just start saying, which is that um, more technically, you do this, you consider things with, with C star actions. So there's a lot of, um, precisely, a lot of the technical work goes into precisely that issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, involve, it involves using a, um, a famous um, Hilbert Mumford. One needs to show the automorphism group of this limit is reductive. And then you can apply a, a famous term of Hilbert and Mumford to get the, the one parameter subgroup which sort of generates this. Product. But it's, it's an important point. More questions? Not, let's thank the speaker again.